What's up, y'all? It's Shuffle, a.k.a. The Shuff. We're here with the Shield Breaker Guide. The long-awaited, not as long as the Awaited Grave Robber one, which took probably like six months before I actually got it out there. A little longer. Anyway, I'm trying not to ramble. I have already recorded this video once, and I felt it was too long, so I'm going to try and shorten it a little bit, because I always just start talking about so much stuff. And the analysis just gets so much... There's just so much to talk about. Uh, so I'm just going to... I'm going to go over my entire notes, as always. I'm going to give you the strengths, weaknesses, uh, some of the other things that are cool about the character. Probably look at some trinkets, maybe. and Well, not maybe, definitely. And uh, finally, where they're good at. And the teams, builds, all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty much the order. And as every YouTuber says, let's get started. It's weird, like... When I say every YouTuber says it, and then I say it mockingly, but I do it in like every video, does that just make me the thing I've sworn to destroy? Who knows? Alright. Shieldbreaker. What is she good at? Uh, she has a couple really good mechanics. Um, she has one that's unique to her, which is guard breaking. And between those, her high base damage and her ability to armor pierce, she can fill a lot of roles on your team. But make no mistake, she is a dedicated damage dealer, just because she can block, which is one of her other unique mechanics. Uh, that does not make her a tank. That lets her survive. She can get really high hit point values, but she can't mark herself and she can't guard other heroes, which means she's not really a tank. It's just she has some really good uh, defensive mechanics. So it's kind of like how the Grave Robber can stealth. That's her defensive mechanic. Grave Robber can stack a ton of dodge. That's part of her defensive mechanic. That means that the Shield Breaker is another damage dealer, but she can be a little more tanky, so uh, definitely keep that in mind. So getting into the analytical part, the first thing we're going to talk about is the Armor Piercing. It comes solely from the move Pierce, which is appropriately named. This move also lets her move forward, which helps her fix either her own positioning or the positioning of allies. And as I said before, it has just a modest damage penalty of minus 10%, but Shield Breaker has massive base damage of 9 to 18 I think that's higher than uh, Highwayman, who's I think 9 to 16. But either way, uh, Shieldbreaker has really good base damage, so just this minus 10% isn't the end of the world. It brings her down to 8 to 17, 8 to 16, something like that, with Pierce. But then just being able to skip the enemy's protection stat, uh, you're going to squeeze out a lot more damage than if you just tried to hit them with something that didn't have piercing. So it's a really good move. I think it should be on every build just because it lets her go into every zone. If you can't blight the enemies, you can still pierce them for big damage. The next mechanic of hers that we need to talk about is coming from Puncture. This is a move that guard breaks. It does some other cool stuff like pulling them up two spaces, which can get your uh, pesky backlining cultists or crones or what have you, pink fish, up to the front where your melees, your proper melees can uh, chop them down. My cat is distracting me because I locked him out and now he's meowing at the door. Um, but the big thing of Puncture is the, the guard breaking. It's also nice that it can be used in every single spot on every single spot. So it's just got this huge universal coverage. And I don't remember if I mentioned that, but the, the big thing about, or one of the big things about Grave Robber, not Grave Robber, I keep doing that. Uh, Shield Breaker is her reach. She's got a big damage stat and she can hit almost whatever she wants at any time. So Puncture is really good. You don't use this for damage. You use this if you want to pull something and if you want to break guard. I would say the order should be break guard and then pull and then maybe damage and then if you care, the minus speed. I, I forget that it has that. It's so inconsequential usually. But the guard breaking is really nice because some zones such as the, the ruins and the cove specifically have a lot of guarding mechanics. So this gets you past those, and without being spoilerific, there is one boss in the game that is specifically crutching on a guard mechanic. And so you can bring Shield Breaker to that fight, and it really trivializes it. So she's got a lot going for her in that regard. The reason her reach is really important is because it makes her very flexible on what she can hit. And there's this idea of game balance in Darkest Dungeon that if you ever notice the backliners, especially like the hero classes, so like Arbalest, Grave Robber, they're considered backline uh, 
damage dealers, right? Their base damage is 7 to 14, Houndmaster 7 to 13, right? Those are, they're meant to kill other people in the back. So they're meant to kill the low health stress nukers or the supports on the enemy team. And, you know, there are some enemies that are tanky in the back, but we're kind of excluding those. But the general trend is you have lower damage in the back because the enemies that you face in the back have lower hit points. So the reach becomes extremely relevant because the shield breaker is taking frontline damage. 9 to 18 is frontline damage. It's meant to kill beefy frontliners. She's taking that damage and she can put it into the back. So it's kind of um, cheating the game balance a little bit. So she's able to really do a lot of damage to the back because she has a couple extra damage points that the game is frankly not designed around. So it helps her pick up kills with pretty much the rest of your team. She can always just have someone that she wants to hit for really good damage. Like you can just pierce almost every turn, right? And you can always find a target to help kill. You can help your backliners kill the stress dealers, can pierce the tanks in the front. So her reach is very relevant and it makes her very flexible, which is another reason she's very good. She has a lot of access to blight damage, which is fantastic because she is the frontline blight character, pretty much. You can kind of say the, the abomination, uh, but the abomination is like a mid rank. It's a two or three. The shield breaker can just is primarily a rank one character. So like the very front of your party and she has a lot of access to blight damage. She can set up other characters like the Grave Robber if you want to use Impale and just give Grave Robber whatever target she wants. Or if you want to just do a mass Blight strategy, you can use her and like the Abomination or her and the Plague Doctor. Her and the Plague Doctor go very well together. So we'll talk about that in teams. But you can roll out a lot of Blight damage very quickly. And the more you have of it, obviously, the, the better it does. And enemies, well, I shouldn't say enemies, bosses. They are enemies, but bosses are the only enemies you face right now that have multiple actions per turn. So every time the boss gets an action, it takes a tick, so like an instance of blight damage. So whereas Adder's Kiss, for instance, at max rank does five points per round, if the enemy has two actions, they're taking two ticks, so they're taking 10 damage around on top of the regular just base hit damage. So. Blight stacks up very quickly. It's very good at shredding multiple action enemies. There are a few of those. Well, bosses, I should say. Uh, so, very good thing to have. As I talked about, her high base damage uh, is very good. It helps her cheat by killing things in the back. And it's something I often forget when I'm playing her. Because, you know, the, the 9 to 18 is very relevant. It's very strong. She has high base speed at 9. That ties her in second for a lot of characters. Like the uh, other Blight characters. Go figure, right? The... Abomination, Plague Doctor, both base 9, Speed, the Grave Robber, base 10. So it helps her really dictate the pace of battle. Speed is probably the best stat in the game. I would argue it is. Um, you know, you can't really... I mean, hit points are great, and we need hit points, but it's like hit points are essential. Like, they're completely required. So it's like the de facto best, I would say. But outside of that, Speed, very good. You'd rather dictate a fight than react to it, if that makes sense. Like, when you get to pick which enemies are dying first and they don't get to attack you and stuff like that it's probably the best way to play the game so when I do a new players tips thing that's one of the things I'm going to focus on her other mechanic is she has block that's coming from serpent sway it gives her a little speed boost it gives her two blocks block is not as good as stealth block is still pretty good but block is only really 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 good against instances of just high raw damage because block does not stop the secondary effects. If you get crit, you're still taking stress. If the attack has a bleed and you block it, you still get bled. So block is good. It's good in a pinch. And Serpent Sway, I find myself using it in one of those three instances. Either I need the blocking, because I need to not die. Or I need the speed, because plus four speed is really nice. And the other one being, I need to move forward, but I don't want to pierce. Or sometimes you can stall with it, right? Like if you have one enemy left, you're trying to milk it to get some heals out. Uh, Servant Sway is usually your move to go to if there are no corpses for you to uh, stab with your spear. She's a dancer, which is good and bad, as we talked about the Grave Robber. This one's a little more tame than Grave Robber. 
because she only moves one space at a time, so the only requirement in your party is the character that's behind Shieldbreaker, because Shieldbreaker is usually starting in rank 1, unless you have a speed difference that you're trying to accommodate. Uh, your second character needs to be able to deal with it. This usually is not a problem. Like, you can put Crusader, Leper, those frontliners, they don't care if they're in 1 or 2. Highwayman can dance with uh, Shieldbreaker by using Duelist Advance or Point Blank Shot. So there are a lot of options out there. There are a lot of options that just don't care. As I said, the Crusader, Leper, Flagellant, Man-at-Arms, there are so many out there that just don't care that Grave Robber moves back one space. So she's very easy to fit into a lot of teams. And also because she's dancing, this is kind of a weakness as well. We'll talk about weaknesses right after this. This means that the Shieldbreaker doesn't really have a mid-range strategy outside of sitting in like rank two or three and spamming Captivate. And Captivate's good but not amazing, like, Shieldbreaker has so much more going for her that you don't want to use her as a, like, kind of a, a mark, a mark hitter, you know? Like, you can do it, but I would much rather not spam Captivate. I would much rather use all the other fantastic abilities that she has. And then we have to talk about Expose. I forgot about this. Uh, Expose drops stealth on an enemy, which is cool. It increases their chance to receive crits by 10%, which is very high. It lowers their speed by eight so expose pretty much is a huge debuff on an enemy that can help your other damage dealers but the shield breaker isn't a setup character she's just a damage monster so you'd want other characters setting you up and there are other buffs you'd rather have to be set up with for instance well look at it like this right debuffs are not as good as buffs because there's a chance of resisting so instead of exposing one enemy, I would rather hit Battle Ballad with my Jester and buff my entire team. Does that make sense? So that's why Expose isn't good just uh, from like a base logic standpoint. But the other mechanical application that I do not like, which I don't know why it's like this, is Expose does not hit uh, rank 4. And most of the enemies in the game that have stealth are usually in rank 4. These are your gunner bandits, these are pinkfish, these are crones, right? The only enemies up front that have uh, stealth are like the bone, uh, what is it, bone commander? I can't remember, like the mid-tier skeleton with the shoulder plate, um, and it might be like one or two I'm forgetting, but you don't really need to hit those with uh, a crit buff, right? Because usually you're just going to chew through them in two turns anyway. So Expose kind of fails because it can't reach rank 4. That's why I really just don't like this move. And I can't really recommend it unless you really want to move back a space. But that's about it. So weaknesses. Shieldbreaker has very low HP. It is the same amount as the Grave Robber. Grave Robber and Shieldbreaker both chilling at 36 base. Uh, Shieldbreaker can go up to 40 if you get her district, and then she has a lot of access to other things for hit points, such as her Spectral Spear Tip and the Cure Bully. Her personal armor gives her 33% HP, so if you put one of those on, Shieldbreaker can get up to like 45, 52, something like that HP. If you put both on, she gets, I think, 57 with the district. So her HP can spike very high, very quickly. So the low base HP is only relevant early, when she doesn't have a lot of her gear, and she just becomes very, very fragile. So, uh, that's something we're talking about in a sec. Another big weakness introduced by the Shieldbreaker is her Nightmare Mechanic. Her Nightmare Mechanic is how she gets her trinkets, her personal trinkets, so they're always gated. You have to take longer missions, and you have to take a bigger inherent risk to get her stuff. And then finally, when you clear all of her Nightmares, the Nightmare Monsters can pop up in any area of the game after that. The Nightmare Monsters are kind of tough uh, compared to the normal enemies, and in certain areas you may want to use one strategy to kill them, and in certain regions the strategy you're going to use may not match up with the generic enemy type, so you have this kind of push and pull thing, but there's always pierce, right? You can always just pierce or impale spam and just get through things. The Nightmare mechanic and her gated personal trinkets and her low base HP all compound into her biggest weakness that has to be addressed, which is her horrendous early game. Shieldbreaker has probably the worst early game of any hero. Yeah, text, sorry about that. But yeah, her early game is just atrocious. She is so vulnerable to dying that you have to 
actually use Serpent Sway consistently to block, because, you know, she doesn't have any other defensive mechanics, she doesn't have any uh, trinkets yet, and all of her tanky trinkets that make her a lot stronger in the hit point category come from the end of the game. Like, it's your mid to late game setup. Like, Spectral Spear Tip, Cure Bully, you're not getting those to, like, depending on how fast you're getting through the game, you know, like, week, I don't know, 50, whenever you're getting to, like, uh, top-end champion level things, or you're doing the Farmstead, right? It takes a little bit to save up those shards, crystal shards. So, the early game is really bad. Plus, Impale doesn't have Blight until rank 3, so Shield Breaker kind of has to be babysat for a long time, and in new playthroughs, like Blood Moon playthroughs or Darkness playthroughs, the hardest missions are either the ones where you just get to a new difficulty because you don't have all the stuff yet and you don't have like fully upgraded units, or the very start of the game. Like starting out Blood Moon or starting out Darkness, the first like 10-15 weeks are probably the hardest and Shield Breaker is going to struggle immensely in those weeks uh, compared to other characters like for instance, Highwayman, Crusader, those two just come out of the box ready to go. So Shieldbreaker's got a bad early game that you have to plan around. As stated before, the Shieldbreaker district is very good. She uses the training ring and she shares it with Arbalist, Houndmaster, Man-at-Arms, and the Musketeer. So, kind of a crowded training ring. But it gives her 4 accuracy, which does help. You can almost uh, forego accuracy trinkets in a lot of cases, or you can just get natural swing, and you usually don't need one after that. You might still have trouble hitting some very evasive enemies. You might have like an 80% chance, but it helps her a lot to get over that accuracy hump, and then she gets 10% max HP on top of it, which is just great. She needs that. Her personal trinkets are largely all very good. I had the Crimson Court set on this file, and I lost it in the Farmstead, or the Endless Harvest, because I ran into two unclean giants, and they both decided to just spam Tree Branch Smackdown against my Shield Breaker. Um, and eventually that just got her. So, like, I think I got crit and uh, put to Death's Door. And I don't think I had a Serpent Sway left. And then I got killed by, like, Confusion Spores or something stupid. So, it, it was dumb. But that's just, that's the game we play, right? So, uh, her trinkets are all very good for the most part. Her Spectral Spear Tip is incredible. The 15% damage, 15% max HP, just amazing. Sign me up, please. 20% Blight skill chance. Most enemies, even if they're resistant to Blight, there are only a couple where Blight is pretty much just never happening. And I would say that number is like 5. So, the maybe, maybe 6, 7, depending on how you want to count a certain one that I'm thinking of. But the Blight skill chance, even if they're resistant, you can get her Blight skill chance like 160, 160. 170 depending on like what you have right or whatever the skill is and most blade resists go up to about 120 so you can reliably have her at about 40 35 something like that percent chance to blight which is pretty good because all of her other moves still do really good damage on top of the blighting so this just kind of gets her over the resist spike and makes blighting possible where you would think it wouldn't be possible and then finally the chance to randomly target at 5%, I've had this go off one time, and this is only a big deal when you're trying to use something like Pierce, or Expose, <laughs> I don't know why you're using Expose, but there you go, Adder's Kiss, but even then, like, if you get the wrong target, it's nice because you can sometimes throw damage just on whoever, right? Like, if I get to Adder's Kiss something in the back, I'm not necessarily complaining. That's pretty good, and usually your first turns are Impale anyway, so usually by the time the 5% chance to random target comes into play, one or two enemies are usually dead. So, Spectral Spear Tip is amazing, and I think it's really cheap. I think it's like 75 shards, I can't remember off the top. Definitely one of your first purchases from the Endless Harvest, if I may say so. Cure Bully, you just take this if you want fat HP, and the minus two speed is actually relevant. This helps you deal with uh, speed situations, so you can finalize, oh, I shouldn't say finalize, so you can influence your turn orders in battle as much as possible. So for instance, if you're using Highwayman and Shieldbreaker together, I think they both have base 9 speed, and then you can use like the Crimson Court set for Highwayman, put his speed to 11, then use Cure Bully and put the Shieldbreaker to 9, or not 9, uh, 7. So you can really ensure that the Highwayman's going first, and then you can plan your team accordingly. So don't sleep on the minus 2 speed, it does kind of suck uh, in a vacuum, but... She goes down to base 7 speed, which is so respectable, and uh, she has 
base 9 to begin with, and then you give her a ton of HP on top, so really good, uh, really good item. The Fang Spear Tip, you get 35% damage versus marks at the cost of minus 10% damage flat. Uh, so this obviously mass out to plus 25% damage if they have mark. And you don't have to use Captivate for this. I want to point that out. So if you have a mark team and you have a Shield Breaker on there, your Shield Breaker can just pierce the mark target and just get plus 15% damage, you know, as a net bonus. So Fang Spear Tip, really good. Don't sleep on it. I slept on it for the longest time, but like I said, basically comes out to a good solid chunk of damage if you're running a mark team. Dancer's Foot Wraps, these are okay. The move resist is kind of whatever. The two speed is pretty much why you want it. The move resist only helps in those very few instances of like a cultist girl trying to push you out of rank one so you can't use Impale. So it's not bad there, but not a bad green trinket either. So if you get it early, you want to put two speed on, pretty much that's how you should treat it. The Shimmering Scale, I do not think, is that good early, even though you get it second in her trinket list. And it's 10% prot, but she doesn't have a lot of hit points when you first get it, and then 5% stress. Kind of crappy, because you don't want stress because of her Nightmare Mechanic. So, it's not bad, but it's like, by the time it becomes relevant, like, I would like to use it with Cure Bully, for instance. But, by the time I have Cure Bully, I have other trinkets, I have other orange trinkets, I might have my Spectral Spear Tip. So this kind of falls by the wayside. So the green trinkets, they're not bad, but I find that I'm using them the least out of everything she has. The Venomous Vial is very good, gives her 30% Blight skill chance at 10% Blight resist, and the 30% Blight skill chance is really good. Uh, when I first get this trinket, it's usually one of the two I pair on her for a very long time until I start getting like more blue trinkets that are worthwhile. So Venomous Vial, really good, especially if you get it like pretty early, and you can, obviously you know how the nightmare mechanic works. Shieldbreaker also has really good personal camp skills. I think they're all pretty balanced in terms of effect and cost. So I'm going to ignore the normal three that everyone gets and I'm going to look at her specific ones. So Snake Eyes only costs three points and 15% armor piercing for your companion. So this doesn't mean the Shieldbreaker herself even though she has pierce. The other companions will get 15% armor piercing and I would only use this if you know you're going to run into a lot of armor. There are certain runs or bosses where you know you're going to, so that makes it good then. But otherwise, for as good as it is, I would only hit it if you have like two other damage dealers. For instance, you have like a Highwayman and something else, maybe you're using an Arbalest without uh, Mark Synergy, who knows. But those are the instances where I'll use Snake Eyes, otherwise, like if you have a Plague Doctor and a Vestal in your backline, you only have two characters that are... Uh, doing damage, dedicated, like direct damage, potentially. And Shieldbreaker already skips armor, so it's like, do you really need the other person to have 15% armor piercing for three points? Debatable. Uh, otherwise, there's probably something else you can spend those points on. Like Snakeskin. Snakeskin is great. Three points, 15% prot, 15% hit points. Very awesome. If I remember correctly, the hit points don't get healed when you hit this, so you have to like eat extra food or use a skill or something like that or heal in the next battle which kind of sucks I wish it uh, filled up your hit points with it if I'm mistaken then I'm mistaken I apologize about that but that's what I remember but you get this combo of prot and hit points on top of things which are really nice I think that's a really good combo and when you have her other setups you get up to like 57% HP for instance I think this puts her like 62 or something so that's that's really high that's like leper crusader territory of hit points so, Snakeskin's really good if you have three extra points, and you expect to be taking a lot of uh, direct damage. I think Sandstorm is garbage. I have never pressed this button in my life. It only does one companion. You know, there, there are instances where you can do it. There are certain abilities that mark your tanks, or there are certain enemies that have mark mechanics, but it's like two points for one person that can't be marked. Just, eh... It's not the greatest. I'd rather just be like one point. If this was like three points and the party couldn't be marked or something like that, that'd be busted. So, I mean, I think this is the best balance they could find for it, but it's just underwhelming regardless. Adder's Embrace is really good if you just want to max out your Blight chance, but also don't sleep on the Blight Resist because there's certain areas or certain enemies you run into that Blight is very prevalent. So, like bosses, uh, special fights, things like that, I can think of off the top of my head have a lot of Blight in them. So being able to give her extra Blight Resist and Blight Chance against those enemies at two points 
is good. I think this is a really good skill to use. When you're considering quirks for the Shield Breaker, I think Luminous is obviously the best one. Luminous is just ridiculous on anyone, but specifically the reason it's good on Shield Breaker is because it gives her extra speed, which she always likes. It also kind of counteracts her Cure if you decide to use that. It's good because it gives her dodge on top. So if you were going to compare it to Evasive, which is just plus 5 dodge but no speed, I would say Evasive is not worth taking because you don't get the bonus speed. The reason you want the ability to dodge though is because pretty much the block stacks. Shieldbreaker has this weird middle of the line dodge number of 28. Usually everyone else has like 25, 30 or 20, something like that for base dodge. So Shieldbreaker 28 is kind of this weird spot in the middle. And the reason you want the dodge is because of her blocking. So if you can dodge an attack, then you preserve your block stack so it stretches your block out longer. So being able to fit a little extra dodge in your build is good, especially because she has no way of raising her own dodge baseline. I don't think any of her trinkets even give her dodge. So um, you're kind of at the mercy of like Luminous and your trinkets and your party members to give you a little more evasion. Any defensive quirk is really good on her. Steady, I would say, is probably the best considering the nightmare mechanics. So being able to have reduced stress is fantastic. Tough. Any extra hit points on her is great. You can stretch her hit points really far, especially with tough. Hard skin to get yourself 10 extra prot is really good because she has obviously the potential to have a huge hit point pool. So having prot on top is fantastic. We like that. Unyielding, I would say, like it's never bad to have unyielding, but with her and her big hit point boost potential and her block mechanic, and her moving around, maybe she can move out of the way of certain attacks sometimes. Uh, I think Unyielding is one of the weaker defensive ones, but it's never bad. So if you're just sitting here like, you know, I got 200,000 gold, I don't have a third quirk locked in, may as well just lock in Unyielding until I find something better. You know, I understand that, so those are all good. And then any resist uh, quirk is pretty good for the most part. Specifically Bleed and Blight because she is on the front, so she's taking those hits more often. But uh, debuff resist, stun resist, all good. Move resist, probably the worst one. I would never lock in move resist on any character, but any of the other ones are kind of safe to lock in. If you're looking for damage quirks, I would say deadly is her best one. The reason being she is a split damage character. There's pretty much no way of getting around it. She has almost equal amounts of... Actually, I think she does. She has, yeah, she has three melee attacks and three range attacks and then one support attack or one support ability. So she is directly split in the middle and she can use pretty much any of them at any time the way she wants. So you could lock in Slugger if you're just saying, hey, I want to make Pierce just the best move it could be and Adder's Kiss, I guess, if you're really liking that one. So you could do Slugger, but otherwise uh, Deadly, we like it because of the split coverage. So 2% crit on everything. It's not bad. Crit helps you land your blights better, gives it a 20% boost. If you didn't know how crits worked with uh, status effects, any crit increases the chance of it landing by 20. So for instance, Adder's Kiss sitting at 140. If it crits, you have 160% chance to land it. So we like crit, especially with Impale. Like the opportunity of Impale to crit on one of the four enemies is just great. So that would probably be the damage one I lock in if I had to. Otherwise, you can lock in Natural Swing. This covers both accuracy types, I believe. So locking in Natural Swing lets her not need an accuracy trinket pretty much ever. You know, like I said, you have a couple enemies that are super evasive. You might have like 80% chance to hit. In the case of the Shrieker, maybe like 60. Yeah, that one's not too bad to lock in, even though it's kind of underwhelming at a 5 cost. I shouldn't say 5 cost, uh, plus 5. Pretty much any Prismatic quirk that lands on her is good. She can make use of all of it, she can make use of all the damage, she can make use of the resists. So if she gets one, I wouldn't be in a hurry to take it off unless there's someone specifically you want to have it. Now we're going to talk about team comps, which is probably the thing people are coming here the most for besides just the analysis. So Shieldbreaker has a couple really good ones. I, I think these are going to be two of the best that she has access to. And then I'm going to just give you an idea for a mark comp, which I don't think is that good. But just in case you want to try something different. So the first one is just a standard Shield Breaker Blight setup. The Shield Breaker doesn't have to be set up as a character, so that means she's very flexible on what team she could be in. But this team has some solid synergy 
So you start with the Highwayman in front or the Shield Breaker, depending on your speed outcomes. Then you have the Vestal or whatever healer you want here. Because you can use a Crusader, you can use a Flagellant, you can use an Occultist if you really wanted to. Then you have the Plague Doctor in the back. The reason we like the Plague Doctor and the Shield Breaker is because they both Blight, so there's a lot of Blight synergy there. And the Plague Doctor can lower accuracy of the Frontliners with Noxious Blast. I think that's what's called Noxious Blast. And uh, that helps the Shield Breaker and the other Frontliners stay alive a little bit longer. She also has a ton of stuns which help stretch your Blight damage and help you stall to heal. So there's a lot going on there. She can also clear corpses with Disorienting Blast, which helps the other characters on the team hit targets that they want. And then finally, there's Emboldening Vapors. So the Plague Doctor can boost the Shield Breaker's already high damage to ridiculous levels by hitting her a couple times with Emboldening Vapors. The reason we chose the Highwayman for this team is because of Duelist Advance and Point Blank Shot. This helps the Shield Breaker get back up to the front in rank 1 where she can use her strongest moves, specifically Impale, the Highwayman just puts out a bunch of extra damage on his own. And he's very flexible in his damage, so you can use the Pistol Shot to shoot things in the back, you can use Duelist Advance to get repost damage going, you can use Point Blank Shot to do high damage to the Frontliner, and then you have either Wicked Slice or Open Vein to do some pretty respectable melee damage otherwise. And if you really wanted to, you could spam Grape Shot on top of Impale to get extra crit chance. There's no secret that the Vestal is just a really good character, really good healer. The best healer. <laughs> the best healer. But <laughs> she's going to use her standard setup that I always give her, which is Judgment, Dazzling Light, and the two heals. This lets her reach the most stuff with uh, her damage using Judgment. Dazzling Light helps her stun a third thing that the Plague Doctor is not reaching. And then you just got the heals, which are always solid. And I forgot to talk about trinkets. The Shield Breaker, you can give her pretty much anything that helps her get extra damage. Uh, I have the Spectral Spear Tip and the Cure Bully just for two reasons. One is to obviously get her the damage and the Blight Chance. The other is to get her the hit points. And actually, the third reason is the speed knockoff on the Cure Bully. So if I have Cure Bully giving me minus two speed, putting me down to seven, and the Highwayman with the Crimson Quartz Set and Quick Reflex is going up to 11, I am effectively ensuring which way my turns are always going. So if the Shield Breaker had higher speed, you'd put her first. But since Highwayman does, my turn one is going to be Point Blank Shot, and then I Impale right after, and then I have the same situation again. So that works very well together. And since we're on Highwayman, he's got the Crimson Quartz Set. I just think it's the best set in the game, or the best Crimson Quartz Set anyway. And it does a lot of things for him. I've talked about it in the tier list video, so go watch part three if you haven't already to listen to me give like a five minute gush fest about this stupid set. The Vestal is going to use some kind of healing trinket, so I choose the Salacious Diary. I talked about this in the Grave Robber video, but I choose the Salacious Diary just because it has no downsides. Uh, Tome of Holy Healing has a downside. Sacred Scroll has more healing output, but it has a downside of the minus stun chance. So that makes stun pretty unreliable because it's already 130 base, drops it to 120. So you're going to have a really hard time stunning those 90 stun resist enemies. So you're really just looking out for like the 65% at max rank. Uh, you can use a Chirurgeons, Chirurgeons, whatever it is, the green healing trinket that's 15% if you're low level. And you find that, you can use it. If you find Junia's head early, you can use that too. They're both pretty good. And then I always like to rock a second trinket that is based in support so not healing support but like utility so the ancestors map is my favorite just because 25 percent scouting and disarm is really good if you don't have a rogue this lets your vestal disarm traps to get stress heals which is pretty nice i think she has like a 15 percent chance to fail which does happen but you know it's it's still a good trade-off in most cases the ancestors map can be replaced with pretty much anything that you want like another healing trinket or an ancestor's lantern or a stun charm like dazzling dazzling charm there's just a lot of options there as long as you have one healing trinket usually the second one I don't want to say is inconsequential but it's very flexible the plague doctor in the back only has like two or three setups it's usually noxious blast plague grenade blinding gas and then some choice of third so it can be battlefield medicine emboldening vapors or disorienting blast uh, it's pretty much whatever you want for the fourth move the reason we like the two Blights is just because they stack Blight on top of Impale. 
Noxious Blast lowers accuracy, like I said. Plague Grenade's a double blight, which is fantastic. Blinding Gas is a double stun, which is fantastic. And Disorienting Blast is usually my preferred fourth, just because it's a stun that I don't have a limited use of, and it also clears corpses, which does help Highwayman in this team. I would use Battlefield Medicine if I know I'm running into a lot of status effects, like a Shambler, for instance. Uh, that would be really good. I would use Emboldening Vapors if I know I can't stun things. So, like, certain bosses you can't stun, but if you're on this setup, you're going to probably run Emboldening Vapors just because that way you can boost the damage of your other two people because you're not really worried about stunning at that point. So, like, if they're stun immune that you're running into as a boss, uh, you can just use, like, the two Blight skills, what have you. Maybe you don't even need them. Who knows? You can just use Battlefield Medicine and the Vapors, and then you just have a really strong support character. The trinkets for the Plague Doctor, I don't think you can beat Blasphemous Vial in terms of pure efficiency. This thing has been nerfed at least once. It might have been nerfed twice. It's just really good. Uh, this is a trinket that I try and hunt early in a playthrough, like my first boss kill. I will usually only go for the boss if a Blasphemous Vial is the reward. So it's a really good trinket. The 25% stress is pretty painful, so be aware of that. But we help counteract that with the Prophet's Eye. So the Prophet's Eye uh, boss trophy, we like it a lot because three speed in position four makes it so if you have another speed ability, so like Quick Reflexes or Luminous or Quick Draw or On Guard, those are all really good on Plague Doctor. Uh, that lets Plague Doctor pretty much go first before any of the backline enemies. So like the Pink Fish or the Crones, Hateful Virgos, whatever. The... Plague Doctor is going to get to go first, and she can set up, and she can get that early stun, and then maybe your team can gank uh, one of the backliners before they get a chance to act. So, Prophet's Eye, really good. Then the minus 15 stress helps to counteract the 25% stress that's coming from the last one's vial, and 10% stress is painful, but that's pretty common, so we're used to dealing with that. As I said, this team is pretty straightforward to play. You just put the higher speed character first, and you hit point blank and impale. Or if you want to do it a different way, you can use Pistol Shot and Pierce to gank backliners. But otherwise, you're just doing that until two or three things are dead. Then you're stalling until uh, you can heal up. So you're using your remaining stuns to slow down the fight when they have like one or two enemies left. And that lets you recover with heals, potential stress relief if you can get some crits here and there. Like the Plague Doctor can have some solid crit even though she does like three damage. For instance, so you get a crit on like a 3 damage thing, then you take off like 3 or 6 stress. Those, those instances are really nice. So like I said, this team's pretty straightforward to play, so if you just want to get the base shield breaker experience, I would say rock this. Pretty easy to use. Something I forgot to mention also with this team is that the Highwayman is probably the most flexible character to get rid of in this comp. Like, this could be any other frontliner. This could be a Leper, Crusader. I like to use Crusader a lot just because of the the amount of stuns I have at that point, and the extra healer and stress healer. But you can really conceivably slide in pretty much anyone to that shell of three people, and they're going to be effective as long as they can actually do what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, feel free to play around with that slot. This second team marks the first instance of having doubles in a team in my guide series, which is only two guides in for characters, but having double shield breaker is honestly fantastic if one shield breaker is already really good then why not have two and just be as i said fantastic amazing right uh the reason you use this setup is pretty much impale spam so you have a stunner in the back in the form of a plague doctor this could also be a jester if you just want like mega high stress healing and support abilities that way you have like stress heal hit point heal and speed boost accuracy boost and crit chance which means your impales are probably going to kill the entire team in like three turns if you get a couple crits. So that can be really good. But I like the control variant of having Plague Doctor. So that's why I like the this one and having the stuns. But this team revolves around two shield breakers. Which if you watch my tier list video, people are saying this character is really good if you have like two of them. And I said, yeah, my criteria is that you don't have doubles. But that's just the tier list video, right? So we're doing an actual guide. And doubles are cool. We like having doubles. So double shield breaker is, like I said, amazing. I don't, you know, it's like all the shields are broken at that point. And the way you play it is very similar to the last team. 
where the shield breaker with the highest speed is up front. And so you're going to see in our trinket selection how we're manipulating this, right? So the first shield breaker, well, they're both going to have the same move setup, first of all. So pierce, impale, captivate, and uh, serpent sway. You know what? I didn't talk about these too much. I forgot to uh, talk about the choices here. So pierce is a given. Um, this could be something else. Or captivate is probably the easiest one to get rid of. So you can do adder's kiss if you wanted to, if you want to get like that extra frontline damage. But otherwise, I think Pierce is almost as good in pretty much every situation. So we use Pierce because of its universality. Then we have Impale, which is the best move in the game. Well, the best attacking move, I would say. That isn't a stun or something like that. Then Captivate. We have Captivate because sometimes we don't want the Shield Breaker to move. And this is the only move she has that doesn't move her when she uses it. So sometimes it's like, if I move from my space, I'm going to mess things up. And I don't want to do that. So, I'm just in this weird spot. Sometimes I got knocked back to like rank 3 or whatever, but I have Captivate to do something so I'm not wasting my turn. I'm not messing up everything by moving. As I said, this is definitely the first one you can get rid of if you want to use something else. Then we have Serpent Sway because blocking is good. It's good in a pinch, and it keeps her alive. So, as I said, both Shield Breakers have this setup. The front one is going to have the highest speed. I forgot to talk about how good Hot to Trot is. Uh, this is good on a few characters. It's like a one round thing, but so is quick draw and quick draw and on guard are both amazing. Uh, this thing is really good on a damage dealer just because if you're doing setup or if you have some gimmick like impale, uh, this helps out quite a bit. Otherwise, I like hot to trot on markers or mark characters like the Arbalest, um, but don't sleep on it, right? So the point is you have hot to trot in this case if you are lucky enough to get it. Uh, and you hot to trot your impale, which gives an extra 20% damage. No, 25% damage, excuse me. A bunch of accuracy and chance to crit. So, it's really good on turn one, obviously, because it just shreds the entire enemy team. Really helps you kill them. So, turn one, you impale, and that puts the other shield breaker up to the front, who impales. And then because your speed difference is good enough between the two of them, you're just constantly spamming impale until everything's dead. Very easy to use if you just get the, the right trinkets to uh, set up the speed. The Shield Breaker up front has the highest speed, so we give her something to boost speed, like the Ancestor's Candle, which has conditional speed boost of uh, plus two. There are a couple other things you can use, like the Matchman's Fuse, I think, has plus two speed and a boost in Pale. So you can use that if you wanted to. And then we have to split up our good character trinkets. So this one gets Spectral Spear Tip, uh, the reason being... The other one has Cure Bully, so I want to put my hit points, uh, my hit point boosters split between the two of them, so they're both kind of tanky. So you have Spectral Spear Tip on this, just for the damage and Blight and all that. The second Shield Breaker has Cure Bully, which gives her obviously a ton of hit points. Then she has minus two speed, which helps the first Shield Breaker go first like she's supposed to. And then if you want to do Overkill, you can use a Legendary Bracer, which again takes one speed off and gives you 20% extra damage. Accuracy is kind of a problem with this this setup on some of the evasive enemies, but usually you're banking on the uh, kind of the utilitarian idea of Impale doing the most damage for the most things. If I can warp that perspective a little bit. So, if Impale's hitting three things consistently, it's not too bad, right? If, uh, if the other thing's not dying as quickly, because then it's just going to be singled out. You know what? I actually can't remember if Impale can miss single targets. I think it can. But I know it can miss all targets, and that just looks ridiculous. So if you really want to put some accuracy here, feel free to. Something like a Focus Ring or an Ancestor Signet. Uh, there are a lot of ways to squeeze out a little extra accuracy. Or just Natural Swing, right? Those are all good. That still has the same setup as before, for the same reason. So if you need the, the full explanation, go ahead and rewind <laughs> a few minutes and go look at it. And then same thing with the Plague Doctor. So same setup, same reasoning. Again, uh, I'm just going to not repeat myself to save on time. This final team is more of an Arbalest team than a Shieldbreaker team, but she can function pretty well on it. And it's just a mark comp, but it's, it's a little different in the fact that uh, you have the Bounty Hunter up front, and he's pretty much just setting everyone else up with marks, and you try to make them a little more tanky in certain ways. But otherwise, any other marker could do fine. I think the Bounty Hunter is the best one for this team, though. But, like I said, this is more of an Arbalest team, and it's just Mark Synergy, so the Bounty Hunter, we're going to give him one damage trinket, which the Hunter's Talon, I think, covers a lot of bases. 
I personally think that accuracy is pretty much paramount as like the number one offensive stat because like if you can't hit anything you can't do damage so having accuracy as close to max as possible is usually the first thing I'm trying to do and then has six crit on top and then 50% food consumed does actually kind of suck it comes out of nowhere sometimes you'd be like okay I camped I had a hunger check and you're just walking through the hall and you just expect that four foods gonna be okay and then the hunger check comes in you need five you don't have five anymore so definitely be aware of that take an extra couple foods when you're using this thing but it covers a lot of good damage bases so I think this is pretty much all bounty hunter needs to help do damage besides quirks and then this other trinket can be any defensive or uh, supporting trinket so this could be your ancestors map this could be a cleansing crystal because we're not using caltrops this could be an ancestors lantern or some low level stuff that we're gonna take a look at here in a sec uh, there's a lot of stuff here this could be a tank thing like uh, I think the overture box or the flesh heart right all those are just really good probably the flesh heart might be best here but I just put the cleansing crystal your moves are gonna be collect bounty just to uh, do as much damage as possible when you need to the arbalist and the shield breaker are gonna do a good job of killing everything from ranks 2 to 4 which means the bounty hunter has to clean up rank 1 and this helps him do that it's also his best like one-to-one -one just hit thing damage move you could use finish him instead if you can use the Vestal to stun the frontliner and then him kill it but I don't like finish him that much as a move but I'll talk about more of why in the bounty hunter guide which is not here yet we're gonna use mark for death it lowers prot and it's the second best mark in the game because it can reach anything from anywhere so it's really good and that helps our Arbalest specifically because she needs to get through armor the most. We have come hither just to pull enemies into bad positions. This also still keeps them in a shot range. Like if you pull the rank 4 Pinkfish up to rank 2, that means your Arbalest and your Shieldbreaker can still just dumpster it with their specific moves. This is a flex pick here. You could use Finish Him or something else in place of this, but... Since you're in rank 1, you don't get access to Flashbang, you don't get access to Caltrops. But there is something to note here. Uh, when the Shieldbreaker runs out of Captivate targets, she can Pierce, which then switches the position of the Shieldbreaker and puts her in the front, and then puts the Bounty Hunter in the second. And then you can use things like Caltrops, which I don't know why you would because you're killing the backline first, or you could use uh, Flashbang. So that is probably what you'd switch it out for, is Flashbang, to... Uh, change the team order when it happens but why use flashbang when you have uppercut they're both good moves they're both just fantastic so uh, this is just really good control this lets the bounty hunter just mark things and then uppercut and then mark and then uppercut and just rotate those until pretty much the fight's over shield breaker is going to have the same setup but you can change stuff around as you see fit the crux of this setup is captivate just because we're doing a mark synergy so you're just spamming Captivate until things are dead. Until you have no more Captivate targets, and then you start hitting Pierce and uh, Impale. But the other thing too is the reason we have Impale, we could have Adder's Kiss if we wanted to, but I think Impale just has more more going for it. So sometimes your Shieldbreaker may have to hit uh, Serpent Sway before everything's dead from your Captivate spam. So you need a way to move backwards. So having one move that moves you back is probably uh, ideal. Her trinkets, pretty much the Fang Spear Tip isn't even mandatory, which I know sounds funny, but it's just an excuse to use it. Uh, but otherwise, any damage trinket's really good. Any protection trinket that keeps her alive is pretty good. Uh, some kind of Blight Booster, so Spectral Spear Tip or the Venomous File, those are good. Blight Charm is also pretty good. I don't like the Minus Bleed on Blight Charm because Bleeds are more prevalent. But otherwise, this has a good mix of damage and tankiness and blight chance. So this gives her a lot of bonus damage against marked targets and then the chance to blight them. And I think Captivate's 5? Yeah, Captivate is a 5 blight uh, move. So can really ramp up that blight damage pretty easily and effectively. So pretty straightforward. Like I said, use the Bounty Hunter to mark something. The Arbalest and the Shield Breaker both attack it. It's usually dead by that point. Usually one of them hitting it's going to kill it, but... Well, maybe not so much the, the Shield Breaker, because she doesn't have, um, like, crit bonus off mark. You know, Captivate has crit, but that's about it. Your Vestal, I just gave her some lower level trinkets, so in case you're like, Shuffle, I don't have those, you know, high-end trinkets, and I haven't played the game 
for, you know, 200 hours and my file isn't at week 70, right? I need something else. So the survival guide is pretty much the Ancestors map, like, junior version. It's the same thing with a different penalty and just, like, weaker in terms of overall power. But the 10 scouting, never bad, right? I never turn out scouting. Scouting's an amazing mechanic, so you can use that. And then here's the Chirurgeon's Amulet, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Pretty, I don't want to say easy to find, like... This does feel like it's a little more uncommon than other green trinkets, but 15% healing, even at low levels when you don't have like high raw healing numbers, it bumps everything by like one point, maybe two points, which is still fine. So you can always squeeze out some extra healing this way, and that's never bad. So this is a really good healing trinket to get early if you can't find anything else. Um, then I'm not gonna talk about the moves again because like I said, this is just the best vessel setup. Just get used to seeing it in every video that I do. The Arbalest is the one you have actually a lot of freedom with. You can use trinkets like the Legendary Bracer to drop her speed to make sure she goes last and hits the mark targets. There are various things like her bandanas or the Sniper's Ring, a lot of things that uh, boost range damage. The Musket Ball Matchman's Fuse thing, which has plus two speed, so I'm not a huge fan of it in this situation, but there's just a lot of things you can do to squeeze damage out of the Arbalest, so I, I think there's too many to go over, and so I just, I picked a Crimson Court set just because I think it looks cool, and it's not, it's not too bad, it gives your Arbalest this, like, good combo of damage plus support abilities, but let's look at the moves. So Sniper Shot, this is why you take her, uh, this just does double damage, actually it's more than double damage because it has a plus 13% crit modifier. And I really wish I remembered the name. There's someone that left, like, an amazing comment to me about uh, Mark. And they said, Mark is a way for a character to put damage on a space that they can't reach. So, for instance, the Bounty Hunter can't reliably hit rank 4 with his axe, but he can mark rank 4. So he's pretty much saying, here's my damage. And then the Arbalest goes, thanks for your damage. I'm going to do your damage plus a little extra. It's not quite the same damage, right? Because you have 8 to 16 against 7 to 14. But you have the extra crit chance, which you could math it out, and it comes out to, uh, you know, some extra damage. In the long run, it does do more than having two people hit the same thing. I think the other required ability is Battlefield Bandage. Having extra healers is never bad, like just having spot heals. And then the healing receive buff, very good. So Battlefield Bandage is fantastic. So I would definitely prioritize those two and then pick two others. Rallying Flare, this is really good if you're going against certain bosses that have mark mechanics, enemies with a lot of stuns, like an area that has stuns, or if there's a lot of stealth, right? And it's got a chance to stress heal, which isn't bad. This is kind of a, this move is like all over the place, but it's not bad. Blind fire, I would only take if I'm expecting the Arbalest to constantly get pulled out of position. But if the Arbalest is getting pulled out of position all the time, why am I taking the Arbalest, you know? Like if I know that's coming, why am I gonna take that? So this is pretty much either used for that or it's used for her fixing herself if the party gets hit by a surprise. You use this move because you want the extra speed to let you go first the next turn and then run to the back. That's why you use blind fire. So you don't completely waste your turn moving. You get to like shoot, get a little damage off, and then get out of there. Especially because the Arbalest is pretty tanky. I think people forget that. She's got a lot of, lot of hit points for a backliner. You could use Bola just to split some damage. It's not that good. But it can be nice when... You have two enemies, and you push one back into Captivate range, right? So, Bola has its use. And then Sniper's Mark. This is the worst mark in the game. I actually hate this move. I don't know why Red Hook doesn't fix this. Sniper's Mark does not hit rank 1. And that is where the Arbalest can attack easily. You know, it's either Bola's or Blind Fire. So, it's like, why doesn't Sniper's Mark hit the one spot that she can't reach reliably? I, I think it's so ridiculous, so... We still have it anyway, just to set up marks for the the rest of the team. Because when you have mark synergy, usually you want like one or you want like two people potentially that can uh, use it, like exploit it, and then you usually want like two people that can set it up. So there's always a mark out there, depending on like team or, or yeah turn order. So sniper's mark still not bad, but definitely still kind of <laughs> still kind of bad, but not bad. If that makes sense. Suppressing fire. This got nerfed. I believe it used to, I think, hit three ranks or something. I don't remember it being uh, like this, but it's not bad. The only reason it's undesirable is because the Arbalest has very low base speed and there's a chance you're lowering it anyway further just so she can keep hitting mark targets. 
and I don't want to go last and then reduce the enemy accuracy and crit of the back line, which the back line, oops, I just punched my desk by accident, but the back line doesn't have the highest damage output. It's the front line that has the highest damage output. So it's like, why am I lowering the accuracy and the crit of enemies that aren't designed to do damage? And why am I doing it going last? Just not, not great. I mean, there are a couple gimmicks, like there are a couple gimmick, gimmicky type of fights to use this in, there are a couple bosses that sit in the back when you fight them. And being able to just spam lower their accuracy probably breaks the fight. So, it's not bad in that regard. But as like a general, do I take this to every mission? No, I don't. Oh, and there's something to note also. The... Let me go back to town here. I haven't bought it yet because I don't have the shards. I'm still saving up. But I would say if you have the Keening Bolts, definitely give them to the Arbalest. These things are... One of the best uh, Color of Madness trinkets out there. It's just flat 20 damage, 7 range crit. Like, you don't have to worry about hitting mark targets. And then it's got a small chance to stress herself out. But she's going to be killing and critting more often. So usually the stress shouldn't come into play. So if you can get Keening Bolts, use those. This team is pretty simple to play. It's just mark, mark things and then shoot them with the Arbalest and then spam Captivate and heal. As I said, this is more of an Arbalest team than anything, but if you're sitting there going like, Shuffle, I really want to use Mark with my Shield Breaker. How do I do it? This is how you do it. Or at least one of the ways, so. I think that's it. As I said, there's not too much to Shield Breaker teams because she's very straightforward. It's just like, can the, can the next person operate when she moves? Yes? Okay, you're good. Spam Impale. Are they dead? Hit Impale again. Is that one thing dead? Hit Pierce. And that's it. The Shield Breaker... Otherwise, now we're doing a, a closing statement. The Shieldbreaker is an amazing character. Like, there's some people that feel she's the best in the game. I disagree that she's the best in the game. Um, I definitely think she's very close. Like, I would say she's probably top five. Like, I can't remember what my tier list looks like off the top of my head, but she's probably top five in the grand scheme of things. What holds her back is her just completely garbage early game. Like, I think people just ignore that fact when they talk about it. They go, Oh yeah, she's amazing, you know, when she's like level 6 and gets to do all these things. Like, yeah. It's, uh... It is an issue. The nightmares are an issue. And I forgot to say this in, um... The thing here, but nightmares... I don't believe you can get them on boss missions. So, if you just want to make... If you want to take a shield break it or something, but you're afraid of nightmares... Take her to a boss mission. Don't worry about it. You're good. Otherwise, when you're playing the game, you get a shield breaker early. Like, week five week three something like that you get them pretty early like they just give you one so you can get her then and uh start working on her as i said definitely babysit her until she's level two because when she hits level two she gets a massive power spike she gets two extra speed and then impale gets a blight effect and that's what that's when she really starts to take off as a character so try and get her to two as quick as possible uh take her on some really easy missions that she'll be safe on and then when she gets there and gets a couple trinkets She's going to start looking really good. Then when you get Cure Bully, if you can get it, you know, pretty early, um, she's she's good to go. You can take her on whatever the hell you want after that. Otherwise, she's a really good character. Puts down a lot of damage. Has the best cleave move in the game. One of the best attacks in the game in Impale. And she doesn't need setup, so she can fit in a lot of teams. And then, like I said, her ability to get around a lot of mechanics, like protection, guard, movement... And then she has Blight, and she can block and stuff like that. She has a lot of utility if you just go, you know what, I need I need that. I need Guard Breaking right now. I need Piercing right now. I need Blight right now, right? You can just, there's so many things you can put her in that she will succeed in. So definitely a great character. Just, as I said, watch out for that early game. Um, also amazing in the Farmstead. I forgot to say that. She's probably the best Farmstead character outside of, like, Jester and Vestal just because... You know, they help. <laughs> anyway, I think that's it. I've talked uh, long enough. This video should be shorter than the Grave Robber one, I think. We'll see how it is in editing. Uh, let me know what characters you want to see next. If I don't have any strong consensus, I'm going to just go down the tier list in a certain order. I might do the actual full guide to Highwayman, not that meme crap that I did. <laughs> Spur of the moment. Otherwise, join Discord. We're growing. We're at, like... 70 80 people something like that which is pretty cool so definitely bring your lovely self there 
and let me know what you think. Let me know if there are other editing things you want, what have you, because uh, I, I think I'm pretty confident in how I want to do this. It's just about fine-tuning it now. So yeah, don't be a stranger. And I think that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.